That's why I don't go out no more. Just trying to chill. I'm just trying to live a peaceful life. That's why I live in Ohio. You know, I live in a little town in Ohio. It must be like 3,700 people. Small, hippie town. Culturally, it might feel like, like Ann Arbor to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a bunch of hippies and shit like that. And niggas always ask me, like, Dave, why you live in that hippie town? And I'd be embarrassed to tell them the truth. But you know why I live there? Because Yellow Springs, Ohio, has the most beautiful women in the world. And a lot of people might disagree with me, but you gotta see them for yourself. They're gorgeous. But it all depends on what you're into, you know what I mean? I like white bitches with dirty feet. <laughs> if I had a strip club in Yellow Springs, I would call that shit strippies. All naked hippies all the time. And I'd only hire girls with long titties and, and long vagina hair that looks like they slept on it. And I would keep a pile of dirt right next to the stage. I come back, bitch, get your feet in that dirt and get up there and give those people what they came to see. Chalk up, bitch. A couple years ago, I was in Ohio at a shopping mall. An old white lady, this is true, she was, she was following me around the mall, which sounds paranoid, but I'm sure she was following me. Mean lady, too. You ever see a woman with lines on her face that just tell you, like, even if she smiled, it looked like it would hurt the muscles in her face. I knew she was following me because she was at places that had nothing to do with her. I'd be looking around like, what is this old bitch doing in GameStop and Foot Lock and all the places I like to go? And every time I see her, she'd just be looking at me on me. And eventually I forgot about it. So then after I'm shopping, I go all the way to the back of the parking lot and parked all the way in the back. And, and as soon as I open my car door, I hear a voice go, David Chappelle, just like that. I didn't even have to look, I knew it was her. And I looked back and sure enough, there she was, that face. <laughs> to be honest with you, she probably wasn't even that old. She's probably around my age. But she was a white woman, this, this bitch looked terrible. going all the way. I kept my cool. I was nice. I said, hello, miss. And she didn't say anything back. All she said was, I watch your comedy. I said, uh-oh. And then she says, this is true. She goes, it sounds to me like you hate women. I said, well, you know what, miss? It's art, and you're free to interpret this art however you'd like, but I can tell you, as the maker of this art, that I don't believe that I feel that way. And she said, well, I think, and I said, shut up, bitch, shut the fuck <laughs> up. Before I kill you and put you in the trunk, ain't nobody around here. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I didn't say that. I felt that way, but that's not what I said. I was more clever than that. You know what I said? And this is exactly what I said. I said, Miss, before you finish that statement, let me ask you a question. Where'd you see me? Did you buy a ticket to a concert I did? I doubt that. Or, 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 or maybe you watched one of my specials on Netflix. Or, or, did I follow you to your car and do my act? She said, what? I said, keep it in the comment section, bitch, this is real life. Ta-ta! <laughs> and then I drove off. Now, I gotta tell you, and this is gonna surprise some people here, but not everybody. People say things to me all the time, but what you don't know is it does affect me. I think about it. And that one bothered me a lot. I was driving home, couldn't stop thinking about what this woman said because she's not the first woman that said that to me. It's puzzling. You know what I mean? Like, what could I possibly be saying 
that would make these bitches think I hate women. <laughs> Couldn't figure it out. So you know what I did? I Googled the dictionary definition of a feminist just to make sure I was talking about the right thing. And do you know, sir, what the dictionary definition of a feminist is? I didn't either. Listen to this. Webster defines a feminist as a human being, not a woman, a human being that believes in equal rights for women. I was shocked that that's what that meant. Because by that definition, I would consider myself a feminist. And I didn't even know that at the time. All these years, I thought it meant frumpy dyke. <laughs> well, that's who's always talking to be some chicken overalls. Men are trying to rape us. Ah, not you, bitch. We please. I know, look, listen, listen. I, I support the feminist movement, I do, in my own ways. When you guys did the Women's March, I tried to go and support you. And none of my friends would go with me. I asked all the fellas, none of them wanted to go. I tried everything. Come on, y'all, it's gonna be bitches there. They was like, nope. <laughs> so what I did is I called my friend Ange. Ange is a black woman who's a comedy writer, and she's dope, matter of fact, Matter of fact, she's the only woman that I know personally that pays her ex-husband alimony. And she sounds just like a man when she does it. Fuck that broke motherfucker and all that. She says all that shit. So I hit Ange up. And I, I hit her on the text. And all I did, I texted her. I said, Ange, are you going to the Women's March? A and she texted me back. And this is a real text. She said... <laughs> She said, I hope those white bitches get tear gassed. <laughs> There's a problem in that feminist movement, isn't there? From its inception in America, there's always been a racial component. When Susan B. Anthony was having that meeting and Sojourner Truth's black ass showed up. Read your history books. All them white women asked Sojourner Truth not to speak. They didn't want to conflate the issues of women's rights and slavery. But you know how black bitches are, Sojourner Truth went up there anyway. <laughs> she did a famous speech, she said, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? That's right, and, and listen, listen, listen. I, I supported the Me Too movement, but, but the whole time, the whole time I thought that the way they handled that was stupid. <laughs> it was, it was white, it was like... <laughs> they were doing shit like going to the Golden Globes and, and all of them would be like, let's all go to the Golden Globes and wear black dresses to give these men a piece of our minds. Bitch, that is not gonna work. You think Martin Luther King's gonna be like, I want everybody to keep riding the bus, but wear matching outfits. <laughs> you gotta get off the bus and walk. It's real talk, a real talk that was a silly movement. <laughs> I'm not indifferent to people suffering because I know it's hard to be everybody. We blacks, we just got our first big holiday in a long time. Happy belated Juneteenth to the blacks. <laughs> Juneteenth is a strange holiday, isn't it? It commemorates when black people in Texarkana area of the country first found out they were free. But remember, they were free when they found out. They just didn't know it yet. Very, very interesting holiday. You know, I learned something. It was a wild story. I learned this past Juneteenth of a story that's true, and there was a black man who was in South Carolina during slavery who somehow got granted his freedom by his 
so-called master. And when his master granted him the freedom, he also gave him a plot of land. Now, it turns out this brother was brilliant. He had a, a, good, he had a good eye, a good knack for farming. And, and he farmed this plot of land very successfully and made a lot of money. And this is where the story gets crazy. Uh, when he got all that money, this nigga bought some slaves. <laughs> Have you ever heard this before? This is a true story. Not only was he a slave owner, he became a slave breeder and employed tactics that were so cruel, even white slave owners were like, yo, my man. <laughs> he was a wild dude, but he did it just because that's what successful people did at the time, and he just wanted to be down. What a fucking tragedy. How can a person that went through slavery perpetrate the same evil on a person that looks just like him? It's mind-blowing. And, shockingly, they're making a movie about it. Ironically, it's called Space Juice. Space Juice. The point of that story is this person was invested in a construct. That that was the construct of successful people, and he just followed the roadmap of successful people. He followed what they call an incentive. Now, everyone struggles, but I'm very invested in the gender construct, personally. Because I'm a man with kids and a wife, and I like that warm, wet, soft pussy that my wife has. <laughs> This does not mean that I feel like another point of view can't exist. I was doing a nightclub in Oakland 16 years ago, and, and this is the first time that the trans community ever got mad at me that I knew about. And, and I was nobody. I just quit Chappelle's show. It was like a nothing hole in the wall club, and I was doing some transgender jokes in Oakland. It was 16 years ago. My pronoun game was not as nice as it is today. I went too far. I said things like trans and shit. I didn't know these words were bad. And a woman stood up and, and just gave me the business. Started screaming at me. And I'm sure it was a woman. But she kept calling me transphobic and all this shit. I'd never even heard these words before. It was really weird. I didn't trip. I just gave security to look like, you know, get that bitch out of here. And, you know. <laughs> I kept it moving. And then she went to the press, and the next day, one of the gay papers wrote all the same things she had said to me about me in the paper. Misquoted the jokes and was calling me transphobic. And again, all these words, I'd never heard them before, but, but every time that I talk with anybody from that community since, they always repeat the talking points from that article. My least favorite of which being, and I hate this phrase, they say I was punching down on them. Punching down. The fuck does that mean? Now fast forward, it's 2019. I'm in a restaurant in Ohio, a very nice restaurant. It's Thanksgiving week. Uh, and to be honest, it's not a very nice restaurant, but <laughs> it's a nice restaurant if you're a white person from Ohio that's never been anywhere before. <laughs> Picture chilies. I'm sitting in the bar, I'm having a drink by myself, and the only other person in the bar is a woman, a couple stools down, and she was alone, and she was older, and that made me feel sad, because it was the holidays. So I told the bartender, send that woman a drink on me. She's trying to spread the cheer, and I wish I didn't. <laughs> this woman wanted to talk. She wasn't mean, she was nice, but she just wanted to talk about shit that, you know I mean? A nigga that's trying to get drunk, don't want to hear about this bitch remodeling her bathroom, and uh, I'm sitting there trying to be polite. Oh, subway towels, word. <laughs> but then she hits a lick, piqued my interest. She says, my daughter is coming home for the holidays. Go, oh, that's great news. I'm glad you're not gonna be alone. And then she goes on and on about how great her daughter is. I guess her daughter got a new agent, and she's out in Hollywood, she's in movies and on television and all this stuff. And as she's telling me this, I'm thinking, this woman is so sweet. She probably doesn't even know who I am or what I do for a living. Because I know what your daughter's out in Hollywood doing. <laughs> and 
And then she goes, would you like to see her picture? Oh, now I don't want to see this woman's picture, but what am I going to do? I go, okay, yeah, sure, I'd love to, I'd love to, I'd love to see the picture. And, and I grab the picture, and this is all I say. This is all I say. <gasps> oh. She's very beautiful. And as she puts the picture away, she, she looks mean all of a sudden, like she caught me in some kind of trap. What does that face me? And then she goes, she's transgender. <laughs> and I think to myself, oh, this bitch does know who I am. <laughs> I really resented that trap because that trap doesn't let me be honest. If I was honest, I wouldn't fall for it. I just looked at the picture like, ooh. Look at that big chisel jawline, that big thick Joe Rogan neck. Is that a dude? Is your daughter a man? Can't say that shit. It's really annoying. You know, I'm not a pedophile. But if I was... Macaulay Calkins, the first kid I'm fucking, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'd be a goddamn hero. Hey, that guy over there fucked a kid from Home Alone. And you know how hard he is to catch. <laughs> My mind's telling me no. Uh, okay, R. Kelly is different. I mean, you know, if I'm a betting man, I'm gonna put my money on, he probably did that shit. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did that shit. You know, it was bad, okay, so a couple years ago, I was doing a show in Detroit, and I'm sitting backstage in my dressing room, a friend of mine comes by, this chick, Dream Hampton. Dream uh, tells me, right before I'm going on stage, she goes, Dave, I'm working on a documentary on, about R. Kelly. Would you like to be in it? And I was like, nah, bitch, I'm cool. <laughs> I went on stage, I just forgot about the shit. And then two years later, the documentary comes out, Surviving R. Kelly. And when it comes out, Dream's promoting the shit, and she keeps bringing me up. She said, I asked Dave Chappelle to be in my documentary, and he said it was too hot for TV. Bitch, I did not say that. It does not even sound like how I talk. Oh, that's too hot for TV. I would never say that shit. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you guys why I wasn't in the documentary. There's a very simple reason. And uh, I cannot stress this point enough. The only reason that I didn't do it was because, and it's very important, I don't know this nigga at all. <laughs> I don't know anything. I don't know anything that they don't tell me about. I don't hang out with this nigga, nothing. So what the fuck do I gotta be in the documentary for? <laughs> this guy, R. Kelly, got another sex tape out now. Can you believe that shit? This guy makes more sex tapes than he does music. <laughs> He's like the DJ Khaled of sex tapes. <laughs> Another one. Like, damn, nigga. <laughs> it's a lot of tapes. <laughs> the new one's so bad that they didn't even show it. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. The prosecutor in Chicago came out in a press conference and read to the media a transcript of a sex tape. Have you ever heard of such a thing? This nigga read the sex tape. And it was so bad that R. Kelly sounded guilty in the transcripts. It's fucking amazing. 16 times the girl's age was mentioned. Isn't that crazy? This motherfucker is an idiot. He was fucking I'm like, yeah, this is the best 14-year-old pussy I've ever had in my life. And she was like, you like this 14 year old She's like, oh, yeah, I love this 14 I'm like, man, you need to shut the fuck up. You got to give your lawyer something to work with. You're supposed to be on the tape like, this is the best 
36-year-old pussy I've ever had in my life. And then your lawyer gonna be like, Your Honor, clearly my client thought that this woman was 36, as he mentioned some 16 times in the tape. <laughs> they gonna know you lying, though, you know what I mean? Everybody knows no such thing as good 36-year-old pussy. Doesn't matter what I say. And if you at home watching this shit on Netflix, remember, bitch, you clicked on my face. <laughs> Celebrity hunting season. Doesn't matter what I say, they're gonna get everybody eventually. Like, look, I don't think I did anything wrong, but but we'll see. <laughs> they even got poor Kevin Hart. Can you imagine such a thing? Kevin Hart, let me tell you something. It was, it was Kevin Hart's dream to host the Oscars. That's what he told me. And I remember when he told me, because I was thinking to myself, well, that's an awfully strange dream for an African-American. <laughs> kind of nigga dreams of hosting the Oscars. <laughs> Kevin did, that's who. And he did it. Against all the odds, Kevin became the most famous comedian this world has ever seen, and he got the job that only one black man before him had. He was gonna host the 80th Oscars. And I don't know what you know about Kevin, but I know Kevin Hart is damn near perfect. As close to perfect as anybody I've ever seen. In fact, Kevin, is precisely four tweets shy of being perfect. <laughs> 10 years ago, Kevin had made some very homophobic comments. And I'm not gonna repeat what he said, because this is Atlanta. <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm sure there's a lot of gay men here tonight with their wives. <laughs> Far be it from me to offend anybody. All right, I'll tell you what he said. But just remember, these were not my words. These were Kevin's words. And it was a long time ago. And I'm paraphrasing because I'm not good at telling other people's jokes. Okay, Kevin said <laughs> that if his little son was demonstrating or, or, or exhibiting uh, homosexual behavior around the house, that he'd chastise him. He'd say, hey, that's gay. And then he said he would smash a dollhouse over that child's head. Ooh, the gay community was furious. And I don't blame them. I got a lot of gay friends. And all of them, 100% of them, all have told me fucking horror stories about the shit they had to go through just to be themselves. Crazy, crazy stories. And in all those stories, I gotta say, not one of them has ever mentioned anything like their father smashing a fucking dollhouse <laughs> over their head. Because clearly Kevin was joking. Think about it. You would have to buy this nigga a dollhouse to break it over his head in the first place. Does that sound right? Is anybody gonna do that? The gay community was upset, and then they put so much pressure on the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences that they went to Kevin and said, if you don't apologize to that community, then you cannot host these Oscars. And then Kevin said, fuck it, I quit. And then he went on every talk show in America and apologized for six weeks. <laughs> Kevin fucked up. I understand the mistake you made because I've made the same mistake early in my career. This is many years ago, 15 years ago. It's when I was doing Chappelle's show. There's a 
Thank you, thank you. <laughs> On network television, they have a department that's called Standards and Practices. This is the department that tells you what you can and cannot say on television. And if you're doing your job well, you should never hear from them. But if you make a Chappelle show, you'll hear from these motherfuckers all the time. <laughs> and remember, this is 15 years ago. I made a mistake. I didn't even know I had done anything wrong. I had written a sketch that had the word faggot in it. So I had to go to standards and practices. They call me up. I don't know why they're calling me, but I like the lady that runs the department. She's usually really fair, and it was one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. So she sits me down. We have a nice conversation. She tells me, oh, the sketches are great. I go, oh, fantastic. Well, then, well, then why am I here? She said, because, David, there's no way that you can ever say the word faggot on our network. I didn't know I did anything wrong. I didn't try to defend myself. I said, all right, fuck it, I'll take it out. Have a good afternoon. And as I was leaving, it occurred to me, hey, hey, Renee, quick question. <laughs> it's just a question. I, seriously, I want to know, like, why, why is it, why is it that, that I can say the word nigger with impunity? but I can't say the word faggot. <laughs> and she said, because, David, you are not gay. I said, well, Renee, I'm not a nigger either. You know, you know, I have a great reputation in show business, but, but in comedy, I'm, I'm what's known as a, as a lazy comedian, which is crazy because I work all the time, but that's not why they call me lazy. They call me lazy because I do shows sometimes, 20,000 people be in the crowd, and, and I'll tell a joke, and, and they'll all look at me like I'm crazy, but three or four people will laugh really hard, <laughs> and I'll be on stage like, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> Well, this next joke is one of those jokes that... <laughs> it's not, you know what I mean? I like to tell it, but it never does good. <laughs> but I'm gonna do it. You know why it doesn't do good? I'm not good at impressions, but this is an impression. You ready? Okay. <laughs> this is not gonna work. <laughs> All right, this is my impression. It's my impression... <laughs> of the dead people on the Titanic He didn't let me finish. <laughs> this is my impression of the dead people on the Titanic as the submersible was approaching their ship. <laughs> That's good enough. All right, here it goes. Okay. <laughs> right. I, gotta, I gotta do it. I'm gonna do it. Okay, here it goes. Come, join us in our watery grave. <laughs> oh, buddy, that's funny to me. Listen, that is a funny way to die. 20 years from now, on my 70th birthday, I'm going to take a submersible to see the submersible. <laughs> Hopefully by then it should work. <laughs> my wife hates that joke, you know. Do you, do you know this uh, uh, strip club in, in, in D.C. Called, called Camelot? Yeah. Is, is that still open? Yes. Well, I know what I'm doing after the show. I gotta tell you. <laughs> the other day, my wife uh, called me creepy. You know, I frequent strip clubs. I don't want, you know, it's something I like to do. And, uh, and my wife said I was creepy because I go to strip clubs by myself. Is that, is that creepy? 
I think that's better than going with the fellas. That's creepy to me. Hey, y'all, let's all go to the strip club and, and get our dicks hard together as a group of friends. <laughs> drive home in a quiet car and not talk about any of the things we've seen or done. No, nigga, I, I go by myself. But my wife doesn't understand why I go to the strip club. It has nothing to do with sex, you understand? I need a pinch of sexual energy in a room to relax, but it's more about being out. I like the music. <laughs> a few naked chicks in there, it just makes me feel good, but I'm not trying to like socialize or meet anybody. You know, sometimes I go to the strip club and, and I bring a book. <laughs> I do, and I sit right by the stage because the reading like is better. One time I went to a strip club, and this is, this is weird. I don't know why, the, the, the stripper, for some reason, told me her real name. I don't know, so I left. She didn't understand, she was like, where are you going? I was like, good night, Deborah." God bless her, but my wife is mistaken about my life. She told me once she thinks my job is fun. My job is a job. I'm fun. <laughs> it's too dangerous, man. You know, all last year, uh, I, was, I was touring with arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest living comedian, uh, Chris Rock. Me and him toured all year last year. <laughs> and right before that tour started, uh, Chris was involved in what we blacks might even consider a, a, a goddamn 9-11. <laughs> Chris got slapped in the face at the Oscars by Will Smith, which was one of the craziest things I'd ever seen. In fact, if you watch it live on television like I did, when it happened, I thought it was fake. I did, and I wasn't sure. So you know what I did? I waited, because I'm like, you, I know Chris. I waited like... 30, 40 minutes, as long as we take him to get to another party. And I called him on FaceTime, and he picked up. As soon as he picked up, he said, you was the only nigga I had to answer the phone for. <laughs> Apparently, Obama and Oprah, everybody had called this nigga to see if everything was all right. <laughs> and I thought it was fake. I, wasn't, I, I didn't know. So I, I asked him, I go, I go, well, you know, he said, what? I said, well, did it hurt? And he said, yes, nigga, it hurt. <laughs> and then I knew that it was real. And then, and only then, was I offended. And I wasn't just offended that he got slapped. That was only half of it. The real offensive part was that after he slapped him, this nigga Will just, just sat down and enjoyed the rest of his evening. It was crazy. It was <laughs> Not only am I a big fan of Dave's, but I grew up in Springfield, Ohio. A yes. About 15 minutes away from where Dave lives now and spent a lot of his childhood. I know we're in D.C., and he spent a lot of time here, too. But Dave is from Ohio, okay? We're claiming him. Most of the outstanding bold-faced names from Ohio become famous after they leave Ohio. <laughs> One could argue they have to leave Ohio to succeed. <laughs> but amazingly, Dave still lives in the Buckeye State. <laughs> he still lives in the kind of town that makes people wonder, why does Dave Chappelle live in that town? <laughs>
I love you. I've known this dude since he first started, and it was 1992 or three, and he came on the bus, and he's like, hi, I'm Dave Chappelle. I was like, yo, you're Dave Chappelle. I know who you are. I saw Robin Hood Men in Tights. And I'm probably the only rapper that was watching Mel Brooks back then. <laughs> I bought Dave his first suit when he did Letterman in 1995. Wow. Might have been 94. I took him to Barney's with my cousin. Wow. He was still wearing um, cross colors. <laughs> <laughs> Now don't tense up for me. I want you guys to think I'm like an angry black guy. I, mean, I am an angry black guy, but you know what I mean? I have a right to be an angry black guy, though. It's different for me. See, I don't know if you guys believe in reincarnation or not, but I have been black four lives in a row. I need a break. <laughs>